It's not often I watch movies out of order. It's something about the OCD part of my brain that just doesn't like doing it. I always feel like there's going to be something in the story I'm missing if I do it. But I enjoyed Inside Out 2 so much the other day when I brought my kid to see it. I thought I'd go back and do like a retro flashback watch of Inside Out 1 because I actually missed that when, when that had come out. He was a little too young um, to be watching movies, I thought, at that point. Yeah, it was about four years ago, I think, when that came out. Or maybe I just missed that. I don't remember. But I want to just do a quick review on Inside Out 1 and just kind of like close that little close that circle and say I saw them both. Let me give you a little setup to the movie. So we meet Riley. Riley's born, everything's going good. We watch in a kind of interesting ways her mind and her personality develops and all of her baseline emotions, you know, come online. It's kind of nifty. We see how core memories are kind of shaping her personality. You know, a core memory has to do with her parents, how you know, it builds family island in her mind, and how another core memory builds friends and builds hockey, and one of the core memories builds um, goofball island in her mind. So she's got all these interesting dynamics going on from Jump Street. And the movie, very comedically, very it's a very cute way that they put it all together that parents can enjoy, kids will understand and enjoy. There's something a little bit in there for everybody in the, in the setup to that movie. We're running a little bit of trouble when Riley has to move from the only home she's ever known in Minnesota, just to move all the way across the country to San Francisco because dad's got a new business opportunity. So she has to leave everything that made her, her so far behind, so she thinks. She gets to a new school, things don't start too well, and little by little, Riley starts to shut down and lose, lose touch with who she is. And we see that happen. It's all kicked off when joy and sadness have a little kerfuffle and accidentally like dump the main system of Riley's core memories. They get sucked up through the pneumatic tube and fired back into the deep dark recesses of Riley's mind called long-term memory. So with joy and sadness way out in the deep, the backwards, uh, the backwoods of her mind, the other three emotions are kind of left to sort things out as Riley tries to cope with being the new girl in school and not knowing how to reach out to her parents and all those other things that we've all been through. We all know what that feels like, probably to move schools and to be the new kid and feel a little left out or unsure, those kind of things. So you have two stories mainly that go on from there, with joy and sadness in the way out there, and then with the other three emotions, uh, disgust, fear, and anger, left to try to impersonate the both of them to keep Riley moving forward. What happens over the 90 minute, nice tight runtime, gotta give him big credit for that, our joy and sadness trying to collect the core memories to bring them back and basically reinstall them because they're still seeing through Riley's eyes what her day to day is looking like and it's not looking good and Joy really just wants to get herself back that way Riley can feel happy again which is all very nice and you know, it's understandable and heartfelt. Problems arise in getting back to, they call it headquarters, it's basically you know the control board you see in all the trailers in Riley's mind, joy and sadness, can't quite get back because every move they make, they're impeded by a part of Riley shutting down in the real world as she feels more and more alienated from her parents and from the life that she had left behind. So we watch in progression as the, the islands that are in her personality start to fall apart and fall into the memory chasm, they call it. It's basically where things go to get forgotten. And it's suitably depressing when it happens because we all kind of, we all know what that feels like when you start to lose track of the names and the faces of school, you know, school age friends that you had back in the day or old neighborhood friends that you had back in the day as you grow up and you lose touch and things that you needed to get you through your day to day aren't as important anymore. Like the movie has a section where part of Riley's um, like goofier memories she doesn't need them anymore, including an imaginary friend she had when he was uh, when she was three. The imaginary friend comes back into play because he's still mucking around in the imagination land of her of her mind. But he's starting to fade, and he and he fades increasingly quicker when he accidentally falls down the memory hole with Joy later in the movie. And in one of the movies, two really decent, heartfelt, gut punchy scenes. Um, the the friend, the imaginary friend, I believe his name was Bing Bong. Um, Bing Bong actually sacrifices himself so Joy can get out of the memory chasm. And it, it was it was pretty pretty boom when it happened. I was feeling that. That was good. So the, as, as far as Pixar movies go, Inside Out 1 definitely had some of the... It felt like old Pixar. I mean, I haven't seen them all. I haven't seen all the recent ones. But I was getting like Shrek Toy Story Cars vibes when it, when it counted here, which was kind of cool. It was nice to have that that feeling again watching this kind of animated movie. You know, it's, just, it's a straightforward story about a girl growing up. You know, she's like age 11, I think, in this movie when it goes down. So we know exactly what that, that time of life can feel like. So as the personality islands are falling apart, she's losing 
touch in real time with things that she really loves, like her friends in Minnesota. You know, we see them having a Skype conversation on the computer and Riley hangs up on her, gets angry. And then in her mind, we see Personality Island crumble and kind of fall into the memory the memory chasm abyss. And then later, like one of the last couple of things to fall is Riley steals her mom's credit card. And we watch that. We watch Honesty Island fall apart. Kind of her, one of her core values, honesty, fall apart and fall in. And then she makes the, in the act, in the third act of the movie, she makes the pivotal decision to kind of run away from home. And that sets up the finale, which is super heartfelt again when, when it all resolves itself is once again, Joy kind of figures out much like I said in, in my review of Inside Out Part 2, um, Joy figures out that it's more important that Riley be balanced than be happy all the time. And she comes to the understanding that sadness plays a pivotal role for a reason and that all of Riley's memories that are tinged by sadness, typically because she has a good family and good friends and she's well supported, it gives way to, to joy down the line. Like things, things are blended. And we see that in the movie as all the different memory orbs that are typically one color represented by each of the emotions up front. By the end of the movie, the new emotions are, are blended. You know, they're red and blue. They're yellow for joy and green. You know, they're all, it's, it's more complicated and complex. And I thought that was nice that that was kind of a concept that they included, you know, into um, Inside Out 2, where as anxiety and more grown up emotions come into Riley's life, instead of just being black, white, no shades of gray, things become more complicated and woven which I thought was a nice touch. I also really enjoyed watching this backwards from part two where we can see things they took from this movie and kind of extended also in, into part two, much like with the anxiety thing, where Riley's love of hockey starts young. Her relationship with their parents starts this way. There's consistency between those bonds and who she is as a person between part one and part two, which makes me kind of wonder about a potential part three, and three is going to happen, guys. This movie's destroying the box office. I think it's up to like 720 million global or something crazy. But I wonder what part three will be because there's only a year's worth of difference between one and two. So if three in a couple of years shifts Riley into being say 13 or 14 years old, is this gonna be time for a first romance kind of complication to come in and how you might deal with you know a first breakup? I could definitely see that happening. And I, I think it would be a worthy story for them to tell because this, this staff seems to have a really good head on their shoulders for telling sensitive, delicate, complicated, but accessible stories for young ages and adults who are gonna be stuck bringing them to see them. I think there's something in this movie for everyone. So I'm gonna give this one a Winter Wolf Approves, Inside Out Part One, go check it out. It's on Disney Plus, then go see part two if you haven't. Uh, definitely worth the watch and I will see you guys in the next one.